because Nietzsche was so polemical and because he's become so notorious, he has been misunderstood in a good many ways. In fact, there are probably more rumors, myths, misunderstandings about Nietzsche than about any other philosopher. So what we'd like to do in this lecture is to straighten out some of these misunderstandings and talk about the ways in which the rumors of Nietzsche have circulated and why most of them are downright false. As I suggested in my introduction to the first lecture, um, I married a Nietzsche scholar, and I'd like to introduce her. Uh, this is Kathy Higgins, who is my wife and also my colleague. Uh, we do spend a lot of time talking about Nietzsche, and what we'd like to do is to talk about some of these misunderstandings, such as the idea that Nietzsche was crazy, the idea that Nietzsche was a Nazi, the idea that Nietzsche hated women, the idea that Nietzsche hated both Christians and Jews, the idea that he loved barbarians, and so on. But let's start out with the myth, really, that defines a good deal of the Nietzsche popular culture. It's one which has appeared in a, actually a philosophy textbook under the following guise. Nietzsche was crazy, therefore we don't have to take seriously anything he said. And I'm going to start by asking Kathy, what about this idea that Nietzsche was crazy? Well, obviously, if you use crazy as the vernacular for um, being mentally ill, that does pertain to Nietzsche in the last decade of his life. The big question um, with regard to um, the rumor, however, is whether that applies to any of his writings. I think sometimes people have thought that he was crazy because he tends to write in hyperbole and be rather bombastic, um, sort of praising himself and um, putting down his opponents, particularly his autobiography, which he names Ecce Homo, actually the words that Pilate spoke to the crowd when presenting Jesus, behold the man. Uh, he uses a lot of bombast, talks about why he's a destiny, why he writes such good books, why I am so wise is one of his chapter titles. Actually, I think that uh, what he's pointing to is the fact that anybody writing an autobiography is really trying to tell you what's so wise about them why they are such a good and interesting person. And Nietzsche's being just a little bit more honest about that, I think, in a joking way. So most of the times, what's been sometimes interpreted as craziness is actually a kind of perverse sense of humor. At the same time, um, some people have found that their interest in this is really more lurid than anything, because one um, rumor that I think has a certain amount of um, basis for it is the idea that Nietzsche was crazy because he was syphilitic. And that was indeed the, the diagnosis that was given to him when he was taken to the asylum after his collapse. One question um, that this immediately sparked is, well, where did he get syphilis? A possibility is that he inherited it from his father who died when he was young um, and was diagnosed as having softening of the brain which is a little hard to quite know how we'd um, describe it in the current day. Other uh, rumors, of course, are that Nietzsche contracted this in his adult life. And I think the main reason this is a matter of interest to people is really um, the same kind of sensationalism that drives people to tabloid journalism. Uh, what was Nietzsche's sex life like? Um, and as a matter of fact, he was pretty discreet on this topic. I think that's right, um, although there have been speculations recently uh, that Nietzsche's sex life wasn't as empty as we once thought it was. Um, there are rumors today, uh, backed up by some factual considerations, that Nietzsche may have been gay. And given the combination of his discretion and the forbidden nature of such activity in the 19th century, that would make a lot of sense. As for his earlier sexual activity, the one story we have is that he was taken to a brothel when he was a fairly young man and he enjoyed himself by sitting down and playing the piano. I think that summarizes <laughs> Nietzsche's sex life better than anything else does. Well, also, I think that um, with regard to the rumor that he was gay, he may have been, but it reminds me of a radio show I was listening to one time on a classical station that was having a kind of tribute to Tchaikovsky. And someone phoned in and asked, is it true that Tchaikovsky was a homosexual? And the announcer paused and said, yes but that isn't the only reason we admire him. And I think that that's fairly apt for Nietzsche as well. One of the things, of course, that's most often known about Nietzsche, which has still a, a matter of considerable um, accusation, even by people who should know better, is that Nietzsche hated women. He grew up in a family of women, to be sure, but 
you must take a lot of flack as a female Nietzsche scholar. I'm sure people have always asked you questions like, what is a nice girl like you doing with a quad <laughs> like him? Yes, uh, that has kind of plagued my career as a Nietzsche scholar. Uh, and I think there's lots to say about it, um, and um, I'll say more about it later in the series. One of the things I'd like to point out is that Freud was greatly influenced by Nietzsche precisely because Nietzsche was aware of his own problems with women. Um, Nietzsche, for instance, comments that if you want to know why a man views women the way he does, take a look at his relationship to his mother. Um, and I think that's one of the themes, one of many, that um, Freud picked up on in developing his own theory. So Nietzsche was very self-aware about the fact that his attitudes toward women were complicated and not entirely desirable. He also does some very interesting things in writing about women. For example, suggesting that uh, one take the motivations of a woman from her own point of view seriously, um, something I think was kind of unheard of among, uh, among writers of his period. The main reason, besides some outlandish statements, which we'll discuss later on, that he has this reputation, I think, is that he was very much opposed to some of the practices and um, goals of the feminist movement of his day, particularly the desire to make women more like men. From his point of view, the, his contemporaries um, in Europe, the, his male contemporaries, were hardly any role model. And the idea of um, women also trying to be like men, who he found too conformist to begin with, was certainly not going to improve much of anything. So some of this has to do with his general goals for human individuality and diversity. Um, a unisex ideal is far from what he wanted. What about his attitude towards Christianity? Certainly it was hostile. He publishes a good deal which is straightforwardly antagonistic. That's certainly true. Um, nevertheless, it's important to notice what he is and isn't antagonistic about. Um, as you mentioned, he wasn't particularly antagonistic about the historical Jesus or his insights, but he thought that the development of the church and some of the motivations of church leaders was far from as benign as it posed itself as being. Um, he tends to criticize what Kierkegaard called Christendom, um, the sort of social practices that have gone on um, surrounding the Christian religion, institutionalized behavior that really isn't very um, meaningful to people's lives for any but social and even political reasons. And a lot of times he thought that what passed itself off as a kind of um, good way of being, a virtuous way of being, was actually both self-righteous and deeply self-interested. I think one of his great one-liners here is, the Christian law of love, in the end it wants to be paid well. Uh, I think maybe that kind of sums up his attitude. And his attitude towards the Jews, um, it's often said that he's anti-Semitic. I've already suggested he's not, but... Right. Um, I think one of the reasons, besides his association with Wagner, who <laughs> was anti-Semitic, for this rumor is that he does talk about the Jews as such at times, and not all of his characterizations are complimentary. On the other hand, almost none of his characterizations of any human group is complimentary. He talks about Germans, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists. Um, he has characterizations to make, or sort of caricatures to make, of all of these groups and what they pride themselves on. But I think a lot of his comments about the Jews have the very interesting function of really attacking anti-Semites. Since anti-Semites of his era were very much concerned to separate Christianity from Judaism, usually suggesting that Christianity was the superior way of looking at things, what he keeps drawing attention back to is the fact that Jesus was a Jew, that Christianity began as a Jewish sect. So frequently when he says something about um, the Jewish way of looking at the world, he makes it very clear that he isn't separating Christianity from this Jewish tradition and uh, reminding anti-Semites over and over again, well, of course, one would expect Jesus to say this, being a Jew. It sounds like an anti-Semitic line, but actually I think it's an attack on those who pride themselves as being followers of Jesus, not anything Jewish. Then, of course, there's the rumor that Nietzsche was a Nazi. Uh, just to say the obvious to begin with, the Nazi party didn't come into existence until 1919, and of course Hitler didn't come to power until 33. Nietzsche was dead by 1900 and was out of his mind by 1889. He was very unsympathetic, in fact, to what we might call the proto-Nazi movement. Uh, he broke with his sister over precisely this issue. He hated his brother-in-law for the same reason. And it's Elizabeth who, through the editing of some of Nietzsche's works, 
particularly the non-book, The Will to Power, which is published as a Nietzsche book, but in fact was just a bunch of his notes, that is often used to convey the impression that he supported some of her fascist politics. He did not. In fact, I think Nietzsche was virtually apolitical. Um, with some stretching, you can find some political comments. He certainly is anti-Bismarck and anti-militarism and anti-German nationalism. But if he had a politics at all, I think the thing to say is that it would be the politics of ancient Greece, the kind of aristocracy which literally means rule by the best. But that's the very antithesis, of course, of what the Nazis had. Of course, Nietzsche's slogan, will to power, does tend to reinforce the image of Nietzsche as, if not proto-Nazi, at least um, favoring the kinds of abuses that the Nazis were guilty of. Um, it sounds, for instance, like a defense of power politics. And Nietzsche's attitude, I think, toward politics is that it is an expression of will to power. Um, will to power, as he sees it, is a kind of description of a generic motivation for human beings and basically all biological beings to enhance their life. And certainly, um, if you're talking about political battle and entrenchment, the idea of um, sort of being on the offense uh, rather than the defense strikes a lot of politicians as reasonable and would strike Nietzsche as a manifestation of this drive to enhance your situation. But when he talks about will to power, it often is not politics he has in mind at all or anything uh, like um, anything related to military conquest, as it's sometimes been thought. In fact, probably his most frequent type of example would be the will to power manifest by artists who want to extend their influence broader than, um, than it would be if they were just people without um, any kind of further way of communicating with the world. So power he sees on all kinds of levels, certainly not um, something that he sees as especially a matter of politics. And often politicians strike him as inordinately crude and unsubtle in their efforts and therefore not very effective. Nietzsche also, of course, has a reputation as a warmonger. It's not hard to understand where that comes from. During the First World War, the Kaiser's troops were carrying around copies of his book, Thus Built Zarathustra, in their knapsacks. Nevertheless, Nietzsche himself was certainly not pro-war. He served as an orderly in the Franco-Prussian War, not as a soldier. If anything, Nietzsche despised war and despised the kinds of motives that gave rise to it, the nationalism, the chauvinism, and so on. Nevertheless, Nietzsche had a very competitive notion of life, the idea of life as a struggle, and he also suggested that we take a much more realistic view of human life and human nature than most moralists were prone to do. In particular, he has several passages where he talks at great length about cruelty, something which most moralists mention only by way of saying how horrible it is. Well, without denying its horror, Nietzsche also wants to point out what a major role it has played in human life. And he himself, in himself, saw that it is much more complicated than morals would make it out to be. He says, for example, in a letter of 1882, one gets to love something, and one hardly be has begun to love it profoundly when the tyrant in us, which we call our higher self, says, sacrifice that to me. I tell you frankly that I have in myself much of this tragic complexion to be able not to curse it, I would like to take away from human existence some of its heartbreaking and cruel character. Nietzsche didn't admire barbarians. What he admired was dynamic life, and dynamic life, unfortunately, includes some cruelty. But the people he admires, we're not talking about Conan, we're talking about people like Goethe, the great German poet, or perhaps Beethoven, artists who excel who fight not with other people, who fight not between themselves, but rather who fight with the envelope of creativity. That's what he's really talking about. I think he also appreciated the way that uh, war sometimes brings out in people's character a real commitment, a willingness to really um, throw your life and even risk your life for something. And that's something that we'll see repeatedly as a major value in a positive sense for Nietzsche. But as far as um, defending him against a charge that he admires barbarians, what about the opposite charge that he really wants to bring about a super race? 
Well, Nietzsche is often condemned as a eugenicist, someone who believed in breeding the right kind of person. I think this is a view that is colored by the fact that we're looking back through the Nazis and the awful things they did in the names of eugenics and euthanasia and the master race. But of course, if we're thinking around the period of 1880 or so, Nietzsche was just one of many, many European intellectuals who thought that breeding a better kind of person and discouraging the proliferation of weaker, more troublesome, asocial types of human beings was a good idea. For example, the socialist George Bernard Shaw in England was an avid eugenicist, and no one would say of him that he was a proto-Nazi. So I think one has to be very careful about how this is interpreted. Nevertheless, he does have this famous concept of the ubermensch, the superman, and he often does seem to be presenting that as a desirable replacement for humanity. I don't know if I would go along with the way of reading it, which, I mean, admittedly he sets up, which is to say that this is a kind of replacement or an evolutionary goal. I think he's very happy when he presents the notion of the Superman or Ubermensch as um, a kind of future that's beyond the human future. In that sense, it does sound evolutionary. And he certainly does think we ought to consciously intervene to make the species better. But nevertheless, um, I think he's trying to do a couple of things with this um, image. One is to suggest that his 19th century contemporaries who view the human race as the product of the fruit of nature, the ultimate, um, are wrong. He, like most of his contemporaries in intellectual fields, does believe at least that much of Darwin that the human race evolved from lower species, but he doesn't want to suggest that uh, this is the triumph of nature. If anything, um, he's interested in pointing out that people are often human all too human, and we ought to try to move beyond our present state of existence. He's happy to point out that there is a kind of continuity between us and, and animals. Um, so in that sense, too, I think he kind of likes the ring of the evolutionary in this image. But if anything, I think the, the rare contexts in which this image even comes up, it's almost exclusively in very early part of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and the primary discussion is in the prologue. And in those contexts, it's very clear that he has this in mind as a kind of goal for spiritual accomplishment, the idea of trying to stake your life on creating a better world and creating a possibility of greatness that nobody has achieved so far. He's very worried that we aren't going to have a kind of evolutionary outcome where something superior is going to develop, but instead that it's going to be a matter of devolution instead. This image also belies the rumor that Nietzsche is a kind of a nihilist. As I said in the first lecture, I think nothing is further from the truth, and the notion of the ubermensch, not just what Nietzsche particularly says about it, but his whole notion of striving higher and being more than we currently are, suggests that Nietzsche is profoundly committed to a set of values, whereas nihilism is the opposite thesis. There are no values. There is nothing worth committing ourselves to. In contemporary life, I think the attitude which tragically displays this quite pervasively is cynicism. It's a way of saying nothing really matters. The future really is irrelevant and may not be there at all. Nietzsche is absolutely against this whole notion. He is not, for the, he is not ready to say there are no values, but the contrary. What he wants to say is the values that we do accept, the sorts of values that lead to cynicism, those are the ones to be attacked in favor of real values, values that are worth defending, and ultimately the value of life itself. Well, he might think that that's a kind of universal value, but clearly he makes it obvious that he thinks people not only have sometimes had different kinds of values, but that this might be a good thing. So what about the charge that he's really a rampant relativist? Well, relativism is a much more interesting version of nihilism because it doesn't say there are no values. It says there are lots of values. And in fact, Nietzsche is a pluralist, as William James was about the same time. The idea is that there is no one right morality. There is no one right to live. Rather, the way, is, the way to live is according to one's context, one's culture, one's time, and so on. Now, relativism is often misunderstood by philosophers and by other people as well. 
Uh, there is, of course, a very strong movement in the United States right now in favor of absolute values, although when pressed to spell out what that means, often its defenders retreat to some rather banal cliches about religion and so on. The truth is that relativism is, in one sense, an irrefutable, simply self-evident thesis, and that is that values are relative to the people, the times, the conditions, that values are not simply writ large for everyone, and insofar as we have such overriding values, like do no harm, uh, don't kill people without a good reason, uh, don't take other people's property, the truth is that these are interpreted and reinterpreted in many, many different ways according to different cultures. But there's a vicious notion of relativism which borders on nihilism. And that's the idea that relativism is any view, any perspective is as good as any other one. Well, I find this a deplorable thesis, but Nietzsche did too. If there's one thing that you realize as you read through Nietzsche's works, even if he often presents different sides of an issue, it's very clear that he thinks that some positions are better than others, that some forms of morality are far superior to others. So in terms of relativism, I'd say, well, yes, he's a relativist in the benign, obvious sense. He's very sensitive to differences between people and peoples. But in the vicious sense, the sense in which relativism blends into nihilism, no, he's not at all. I think actually a lot of people who um, have read Nietzsche to a certain extent would criticize the, one, the values that he does think are better than others, particularly his high evaluation of promoting yourself. Um, is he really a defender of selfishness? Well, he certainly made, made out that way. Uh, the contemporary philosopher Ayn Rand, who is very popular in some American circles, while she doesn't approve of Nietzsche because I think she realizes that he said what she was trying to say much better, nevertheless... <laughs> There's an affinity between the two of them, which I think she vulgarizes. Uh, she says that, surf that selfishness is a kind of virtue, and it's to be contrasted with a sense of self-sacrifice. Nietzsche, I think, is much more subtle and much more sophisticated. What Nietzsche wants to say, in a way, is that the notion of selfishness itself is something that we should examine, that we should examine the, the supposed opposition between selfishness on the one hand and altruism or self-sacrifice on the other. The truth is that with a noble temperament, what you do which might seem like a self-sacrifice to others is in fact what you perceive as being in your own best interest because this is an expression of the kind of person you are. The question for selfishness with, with Nietzsche, which he puts in a very simple, pithy question, is the question isn't just egoism. The question is always whose ego? If what we're talking about is the self-absorption and the sort of uh, almost fanatic self-pursuit of, say, a great artist, say, Mozart trying to uh, write the perfect piece of music, or Goethe or Hertelin trying to write the perfect poem, well, there's nothing selfish about that, even though, in an obvious sense, it's doing what they most want to do, everyone else be damned. But at the same time, there's a kind of petty selfishness. It's the selfishness of slave morality. It's the selfishness of, you can't have that because I want it and I'm jealous or envious of you. That's the kind of selfishness that Nietzsche rejects. Well, one of the things that Nietzsche is criticized for as well um, are many of the features of the way he writes, um, not just the kind of mad quality. Um, and I think a related point connected to the selfishness idea and the question of whose ego is that he makes a lot of references in his writings to the type of person that would hold a particular philosophy, often one he doesn't think much of. Um, what do you think about this whole strategy? After all, isn't it a fallacy to claim uh, you shouldn't believe anything Nietzsche writes because after all he was insane? Well, it certainly is a fallacy, but I have a question about a lot of the fallacies that philosophers and rhetoricians talk about, and that is, are they really fallacies? Are they always fallacies? With reference to ad hominem arguments, which is what you're talking about in particular, the idea of attacking the person instead of talking about the argument or talking about the position, well, there's a sense in which that cuts through all of Nietzsche's philosophy when he says, for example, that the philosopher is to be evaluated along with the philosophy. 
that you can judge the philosopher by the philosophy and the philosophy by the philosopher. That means it doesn't make sense to just look at an abstract philosophical thesis. But you want to know who wrote it. Why did he or she write it? When did he or she write it? What were the conditions, the circumstances, the influences? What, what's the thesis trying to prove in a personal way? As I said in Beyond Good and Evil, one of the theses that Nietzsche throws out first is that philosophy is ultimately a confession. Philosophy is ultimately a kind of memoir, even if it's not intended that way. So from that point of view, you want to say an ad hominem argument can be very revealing. For example, he says that Socrates is ugly. Now that's something that is intended to drive philosophers, and especially philosophers who love the ancients, up a tree. But of course, he wants to make an important point out of this. The fact that Socrates was ugly, the fact that he was, as Nietzsche says, lower class, really explains an awful lot of his most profound ideas. Or he says of Kant a good deal about what does it take a person, what does it take for a person to want to believe in that kind of absolute universal morality? And the answer is naturally going to be ad hominem. Or my favorite, talking about German philosophy in general. He says, there's too much beer in the German intellect. That explains an awful lot when you think about it. But it's not just ad hominem arguments, of course. Another fallacy that every undergraduate is warned against is you don't appeal to emotions, to which Nietzsche and I would want to ask, what do you appeal to? Pure logic? Pure rationality? Appeal to the emotions is precisely what it takes to move someone, to get them to think about their lives, and to get them to change it. So I'd say, as for the fallacies, this is part of Nietzsche's style, part of his rhetorical strategy, but I don't want to be too quick to condemn it. I think it's something one should be cautious about, but it serves a very important purpose. Well, at least the idea that Socrates was ugly is documented in a number of ancient texts. But some people have criticized Nietzsche also for coming up with historical models that aren't very detailed. I mean, after all, Birth of Tragedy didn't include the footnotes that many of his colleagues hoped it would. And he does tend to play a little fast and loose with historical facts. I think a way to read Nietzsche on history, especially when he makes grand pronouncements about certain eras producing slave morality, um, the morality of the underdog, as opposed to um, those in power having their own master morality, many historians would quarrel with the exact date at which any such event might have occurred and suggest that this is a vast oversimplification. Fair enough. But Nietzsche isn't really trying to present a kind of um, documented story where every detail is taken into account. He's trying to create images that will cause people to rethink history. I mean, after all, he's referring oftentimes to pretty well-known parts of um, the European background. So, for instance, when he says Socrates is ugly, this is something that's on record. And he draws attention to this fact and says, well, maybe this ought to change the way we look at that whole experience. I mean, what was a man like this doing leading the Athenians? Why was he the hero of, of the youth? I mean, after all, young people at the time tended to view older men um, as having a kind of wisdom, but even more wisdom if they were good looking. Um, maybe we still think that today. So how did this happen? In other words, what Nietzsche is trying to do here is draw attention to a period where people already have some insights. And through these kind of quick, fast stories about motivation, suggests that we really rethink it. They have the function more of parables, I think, trying to draw something new into, our, um, into the foreground for us and not anything like a kind of detailed historical tract. Nietzsche's style is certainly unusual. It's the most striking thing when one picks up a book by him. Uh, one sees, first of all, aphorisms. One sees lots of exclamation points, something that's unusual in philosophy. One sees lots of italics, French and Latin phrases all over the place. But the idea that Nietzsche's style somehow renders him less philosophical, a charge we often hear, or makes him merely a poet or a literary writer rather than a philosopher, that's something we certainly want to reject because what the style does is it reflects ideas. In particular, Nietzsche is famous for his aphoristic style, but the mistake is to think that this is all he does. 
But even in the aphoristic books, which are really the middle period, the period of human all to human, daybreak, and gay science, even there, there's a strategy. There is a detailed organization. And of course, there's an overwhelming purpose. And it's a philosophical purpose. It's to jar us into thinking in a certain way. But other books consist of essays. Some books consist of long meditations. So it's a mistake to think of Nietzsche's style as just one thing.